Thank you. Now, you'd have to have been living on another planet not to come to the conclusion in recent weeks that politics is a dangerous, tough, and sometimes dirty business. There are times when the politician must believe he's got to have a slate loose to stick the job. And similarly, there must be times when his wife wished she'd married someone normal, like a lion tamer or a free-fall parachutist. The Premier of New South Wales, Neville Ram, and his wife, Jill, have just lived through the Street Royal Commission. And this is how Mr Ram told Good Morning Australia how it affected his marriage. I didn't think that uh, I could be closer to my wife and family than I already was, but my wife was absolutely superb. Jill's a great human being. My family came closer together than ever, and in a sense, we're all closer together now than ever before. So I suppose, if you look on the bright side of it, that's the bright factor of uh, being involved in a royal commission. But I don't recommend it to anybody. It's not an altogether pleasant experience. Well, what does Jill Rand feel about the recent events? We'll find out later when she and her husband are our special guests. Now, it's fair to say also that the aftermath of the Royal Commission revealed some of the conflict that exists between politicians and the media. Another of my guests is someone who's had more than his fair share of run-ins with politicians. Mr Muldoon, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, once called him a ratbag. He survives bloody but unbowed with the reputation of being one of Australia's most provocative journalists. He is Darren Hinch. And also on the show, a preview of a new musical called Song and Dance, which opens in Sydney tonight. It's a celebration of song and dance, like this. Great stuff. We'll see more of that and a song from Game at Farlam and the stars of the show later on in the programme. Back in a moment to meet Neville and Jill Rand. <laughs> right, thank you. Would you welcome, please, the Premier of New South Wales and his wife, Neville and Jill Rand. Welcome, the two of you. I know you're very nervous. Not, oh, very nervous. Very, the, very nervous. The Premier knocks over a glass of water. Yeah. You were, uh, in fact, um, once said, if I'm throw a quote at you straight away, you told a newspaper when you got to the top in politics that you're up to your armpits in blood and gore, except you didn't use the word gore. You used something else more descriptive than that. How does it feel now? Well, certainly a few weeks ago, I thought I was up to my eyeballs in the same commodities. But... Uh, no, I feel uh, as if the Royal Commission's behind me. I feel that uh, I've got a new lease of life for politics and uh, it's just been wonderful this week, being back at work, uh, facing those big piles of bureaucratic papers and uh, trying to solve some of the problems. Jill, what about you? I mean, what perspective did it give you, this, this view of politics? I mean, uh, you must have thought you were in a very dirty business, did you? Well, I must say, uh, if one needed any... Uh indication of it, then there it was, that public life does extract a mean price sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, I mean, what, what did you feel about it, going through those, those days with Neville, when his career was, was it was a, a, a ponderable, wasn't it, whether it went Abs well or not? Absolutely resolute and positive throughout. Uh, I was the optimist, if you like, because what? I'm naturally a can-do person and an optimist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I was absolutely convinced that uh, we would come through the way we did, and had no doubt at all that all those scurrilous and false accusations would be dismissed. In fact, I mean, not only the, the subject of the Royal, Royal Commission, or part of the subject of the Royal Commission, but you talk about scurrilous things. I mean, there's more rumours about you two go around than, than any other couple I've, I've ever met, actually. Um, I mean, you must know of the rumours. Of course. I mean, what, well, tell me the ones you know. Well, uh... Now tell me the ones you know. Well, now, I'll tell you what happened, and this is an absolutely true story. I'd been the Premier, I think, for about three weeks, and uh, a near friend said, I don't like mentioning this to you, he said, but uh, I've heard very reliably that uh, you've got a half share in the Watson's Bay Hotel. And uh, I really threw my head back and laughed because uh, all the time I was the leader of the opposition, I'd heard that Sir Robert Askin had had a half share in the Watson's Bay Hotel. <laughs> so I said, well, look, 
You sell my half share, and we'll split it. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the other rumours, too? There was a rumour, too, wasn't there, about uh, you suing the doctor who did the operation on oh, your yes. throat? Oh, yes. I had uh, the most wonderful surgeon in the world who uh, uh, actually gave me my voice back uh, at a time when I thought it just wasn't going to happen. A lot of other people didn't think it was going to happen. A man who uh, is now a, a, somebody who's a lifelong friend, someone I've got the greatest respect for, constantly I hear the rumour that I sued him and he settled and I got a large sum of money from him. Indeed, all up the north coast of New South Wales, wherever we go, isn't it, darling? Uh, they say, uh, uh, that's the land that Rayan owns or uh, that's a block of units that uh, Nifty uh, built. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Jill's uh, got a lot of boyfriends, but I get very envious because uh, all the romance is on Jill's side. I must be a very, very... Uh, Virtuous uh, man. Yeah, or a pallid wallflower. <laughs> Well, of course, the, a lot of the, the rumours do concern the two of you in divorce, don't they? I mean, you must have heard them as well. Well, one does. I mean, you know, you'd have to ask the rumour mongers how and when they start. I don't, don't know about that. But I, I suppose the, the thing is that, that uh, whilst they seem to be so interesting, fascinating for the press and others, they're, they're altogether unimportant to us. And, uh, but they must have an effect on you. Not at all, none I at don't. all, none at all. I mean, you're quite sanguine about it, don't you? On, yes. Really? I was brought up by my grandmother to believe that if you worked hard and you were polite and friendly to everybody, uh, then the world would respond in kind. Well, I must say, I've learnt that that's not necessarily <laughs> true, <laughs> although I'm quite prepared to stick to that approach. I mean, I'm going to. I do also recall, though, that when we were married, a great friend said, well, Jilly, you will have to just grow another skin. And I didn't appreciate the wisdom of that statement until quite recently and I can feel myself like a turtle gathering a, a carapace for protection. Mm. Does that bother you? How do you mean, the carapace? Yes, I mean, does it... Do you oh, have it's to quite wear useful. This... You can retreat into it, you see. <laughs> <laughs> but you must often feel why, why you should have to. Yes, you do resent it a little. I mean, as I say, you, you hope blithely that if, that if you're friendly and outgoing and pleasant and kind, that others will be the same. And you do get a sense that too often people, perhaps, uh, they're not willing to help you do your job. They're waiting for you to blunder. Mm. And uh, that's a pressure. That is a pressure. Well, you mentioned their friends, and I'd like to ask the two mm -hmm. of you. I mean, you've been through a situation now which has not only tested your relationship, the two of you together, but must have tested the friends you had around you, or so-called friends. What conclusions have you come to? Did, well, were some found wanting? I can only say that uh, the people that we really thought were friends remained friends, and indeed went out of their way to make it clear to us that uh, they believed that we were OK people, that... Uh, they were our friends through thick and thin. They believed that uh, uh, the allegation was false and we'd come out as uh, somebody, I think from this channel said the other night, smelling like a rose. Mm. And that's the way it happened. But uh, no, I think our friends were wonderful, didn't you? Absolutely. And we discovered we had many more than we thought. Yes. But were there anybody who you felt had let you down, that, that did sort of reject you? Oh, well, uh, you find that uh, people on the fringe, people who uh, perhaps at times... Uh, uh, want to uh, know you when times are good and when you're successful. It's strange how they reappeared in the last week, but I didn't uh, hear anything of them for the last couple of months or so. Yes. But they're distinguishable. But uh, I think that's life. Uh, you get hypocrites, you get fair weather friends, uh, and we're not surprised at that. But I think what we were comforted by was the fact that our friends stuck. And you must realise that neither of us are afraid of controversy. I mean, you opt for this life and you appreciate that there will be um, you know, attached to a tremendous amount of controversy at all times. Well, I haven't let you and down yes. in that respect. And you learned to deal with it, yes, yeah, that's but true. Well, what kind of strength did you, that... did you draw from the relationship, though, during this time? This time when it must have been very worrying for you, when your career was in the balance? Well, the one thing that happened, of course, was we saw a lot more of each other. Uh, I mean, well, certainly we had this... We, for once it was quiet. We put a line through pages and pages of the official diary. The cats and the dog. Uh, who are used to getting breakfast and dinner confused, actually had got their breakfast and dinner on time. Uh, we didn't run out of milk so often, <laughs> and we remembered to put the garbage out. And uh, we had wonderful long walks. We climbed uh, one of the mountains in Barrington Tops, and I must say there was something symbolic about that, I think, coming through the clouds, you know, to the clear sky above. And that was during the commission, and I took that as a helpful sign. And uh, another symbolic thing that I think of was I was... <laughs> appalled when I looked out into the backyard this morning and I, not this morning, sorry, earlier in the week, and I found the lawn littered with weeds and I thought that was significant because with, as our humour was coming back, so were the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I spent hours obsessively weeding out the weeds as well as the menace, yes. I think, from our lives. Did it strengthen the relationship then? 
very much. Well, I've, I've said, and I think it's true. I didn't think I could be closer to Jill, but you know, I don't want to. It's wanna not a question of whether we're closer. I think it's a question of whether that was ever possible. Right. Well, I can only say she didn't take a step backwards. She uh, was uh, never uh, critical. She was concerned. Obviously, we were both very concerned because it's a great pressure and a great stress and strain on you. Uh, but for us, I think of anything. If it, I repeat, if it's possible. It's uh, even strength of his husband. I, I think uh, his qualities are the remarkable ones, and uh, I don't mean that to sound coy or uh, gushy, you know, but it's true. I mean, remarkable um, restraint, I think, and self-discipline on his part. The other thing, too, is that he developed some patience, which is a nice change. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very action-oriented person and not used to sitting still for long, and uh, I think he's developed um, an, uh, more of an interest in, in contemplative things. Did you, at any time, doubt the um, result? No. I didn't, I didn't doubt the result, Michael, but there's always the risk in a Royal Commission, which incidentally uh, is an Australian institution. It's as much an Australian institution as Stubby's. And uh, uh, we seem to have two or three of them going at any given time. It's, yes, like, that, yes. it's very much uh, the Colosseum in ancient Rome and throwing a few Christians to the lions every so often. And the public at times really enjoys it. Well, it's uh, like a big circus. It's the participants who don't. But when you ask me, did I have any doubts? I never had any doubts about the outcome. But there's always the risk when your life is in the hands of one man, as it was uh, Sir Lawrence Street, the Chief Justice, that he could uh, pass a remark in his judgment, pass a, a comment uh, in his report, uh, which uh, could uh, be equivocal in some way. And whilst you were cleared, it still left some minimum or minimal doubt. And that could be just as hurtful as uh, a finding against you. Can I say that I, th I think one of the interesting ironies of the whole situation was that uh, here you had a person who was so powerful and just, uh, and in this case was absolutely powerless, or relatively powerless, uh, in terms of arresting what was clearly an injustice. Mm. Um, the other thing, of course, that's quite clear is that uh, Australians tend to prefer anti-heroes to heroes, don't they? And, uh, so I think in that case it might have done some good. I do, I do. <laughs> I, I, I could rationalise it from the first day um, in terms of, of the positive because I could think that, and I still do think, that whatever the outcome was or has been, it, it was bound to underscore, was likely to be, it was bound to underscore and underline all the great reforms, the major decisions that Neville's taken before this. I mean, I'm speaking of things like his electoral reforms, the anti-discrimination, equal opportunity mm. laws, the um, decisions in regard to the environment, rainforests uh, and the like, and all these things will be set apart somehow, distinguished, mm. enhanced and championed mm. in a way that they may not have been without this sort of disruption. I mean, I think they might very well have got rather swept up in the great blur of history and not been so um, identifiable as mm. they now will be. Mm. How much, you, you mentioned there, you mentioned actually, Jill, earlier on, that, that if, you, if you're in politics, then you've got to take some of the, uh, the flat that flies around. Dame Leonie uh, uh, Kramer maintained that what you went through has got to be seen as part of the stress and strain of public life. Mm. Is that really how you see it? No, I certainly do not. And uh, it's very uh, easy for Dame Leone to say so. Uh, but my retort to that is that she was in Perth the night she said that. And that, uh, in my view, uh, gave her a very unbalanced view of what was happening in Sydney 2,000 miles away. Mm. So you think that, um, from that point of view, you were unfairly treated. So therefore, you're going to go for the ABC, are you? Oh, yes. When you say go for them, I'm in exactly the same position as any other citizen. Mm. The only remedy that the law, our system of law, provides uh, for damage to reputation by way of libel or slander is an action mm. in the uh, courts, and I brought an action against the ABC. You're not, you're, but you're not quite like any other citizen, are you, Neville? I mean, you're, you're the Premier of a state. Yes. And there's a, there's a line of thought that might say that, having been cleared by the, by the Commission, that, in fact, you should be magnanimous in victory. Yes. Well, you see, I don't regard it as a victory uh, because... Uh, I didn't start anything, and I regard myself as a victim, not a victor. And uh, it's all very easy for the ABC to say, well, you were exonerated, why do you complain? But uh, uh, the very complaint uh, is that they harm my reputation, and absolutely, through my life, uh, my career, everything that I hold dear, into turmoil. Now they say, 
Well, you've been exonerated, why should you worry? Well, why one standard for me and another standard for other people? Having, got, having lived with, with Neville Ford for as long as you have, and uh, in a proper <laughs> sense of being married to him, of course, and gone through what you recently just have, um, what, what has it affected your attitude toward any ambition you might have had to being a politician? Oh, well, uh, let me say that I've learned one thing, one important thing I've learned from Neville is to keep one's options open. However, on the other hand, I think that uh, one of the qualities of, uh, uh, of a successful or survival in politics is uh, a strong stomach. And despite the fact that my grandfather used to insist that I had a cast iron stomach when he caught me eating snails, snails. age two, um, I'm not sure I do have the stomach for it. No. So uh, perhaps I can develop that like my carapace. But be being the being the um, the wife of the uh, premier, you must in fact work very hard alongside him. You oh, just yes. you, you just uh, outlined what you have as a more as a full time job. Do you think you should get paid? Uh, well, yes, yes, yes. I mean, after all, we have to keep <laughs> we have to keep Neville, a predictable answer, Neville, I think. <laughs> Neville in the style to which he's become accustomed, don't yeah. we? Um, but no, seriously, uh, this is something that I've been up and down on in my own mind. Um, not for me, but as a feminist watching other political wives give over really all their drive and talent entirely to the service of the political interests of their husbands and get little thanks for it. And I don't think that's a very happy situation. But as, as I say, it's difficult because it's very hard to find a formula. Mm. Um, there are some wives who, or husbands, who would like to and do participate in public life. There are others who'd prefer not to for mm. whatever reason. And I think if you begin to talk in terms of paying all, or say, all ministers, wives or husbands, mm. then you're making it, it incumbent upon those wives and husbands to play um, a political come public role, and I think they should have the, a choice in that respect. Could be interesting, though, couldn't it, they did pay women. There would be some interesting wage negotiations, wouldn't there? <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd be interminable negotiations. Can I finally ask you, uh, in this section of the show, um, in the time you had to reflect and to, to pull yourself away from public life when all this was going on, uh, did you consider, as part of the future, a family, children? Well, well, it's still... <laughs> no, you well, answer. I, I, I've it's... got nothing to do with this. Oh, you no. haven't? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, put it, I'll, put it, I'll put it more accurately. I've got no say. Right. <laughs> Where you go? Oh, I don't think that's what I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you want to hear? I was just going to say that it's still very much on the agenda, but it's not just something you can write in the diary. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, for the moment... Um, you know, I have two cats and a dog who provide a very responsive little family, and I'm a bit busy trying to turn all that uh, academic punishment to account. I have to make good that scholarship, don't I? You do indeed. Jill and Neville Rand, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Jill thank and Neville Rand. Back in a moment to meet John Meehan, one of the stars of the new Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, Song and Dance. See you after this break. Now, Andrew Lloyd Webber is arguably the most successful composer of musicals in the world. Jesus Christ Superstar, Vita and Cats have ensured him a permanent place in the history of stage musicals. Tonight, Sydney sees the premiere of Song and Dance, music by Andrew Lloyd Webber, lyrics by Don Black. It's already had a huge success in London and looks likely to do the same here. It's not like any musical you've ever seen before. The composer describes it as an evening of musical virtuosity. The first half of Song and Dance tells the story of an Australian girl struggling to find a man in New York. It stars Gay McFarlane, and we'll be seeing her later in the show. The second half of the show is a dazzling display of dancing by a company led by John Meehan. Here they are battering out a good old-fashioned tap routine. <laughs>
Spencer. It's true to say my next guest that he lives his life in headlines as vivid as the stories he covers. Shortly before his marriage to the actress Jackie Weaver, he took a full-page advert in a newspaper declaring his love for her. Before that, he announced the breakup of his affair with another actress, Linda Stoner, on his radio phone-in programme. As a writer and broadcaster, he's got a reputation of being tough and aggressive. Indeed, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Mr Robert Muldoon, was once moved to denounce him as a rat bag. Ladies and gentlemen, Darren Hinch. Now, what could a nice, gentle soul like you, do, you have said to that lovely man, Mr Muldoon, for him to have called you a <laughs> rat bag? Oh, I think, uh, I think I said he was an arrogant, pugnacious, belligerent bully. And I think from memory I said he made uh, Malcolm Fraser look like Mahatma Gandhi. Nothing wrong in that, is there? <laughs> and uh, he was very sensitive and took exception to it. And it was two years later, actually, that he, uh, I was interviewing him on radio in Australia. He was out here for Chogham. And he suddenly the penny dropped and he said, I know you. He said, you're that Darren Hinch. He said, uh, oh, I don't talk to rat bags and hung up. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't he later accuse you of being a, a puffer because you were uh, called Darren? Oh, yes. He said, I obviously must um, hate my parents for calling me Darren. He said that um, I was obviously a coward because I had a beard. I couldn't get a job in New Zealand because I was working in Australia. <laughs> and uh, my mother actually wrote to him and said, you know, how dare you? you know, my son this and my son that. What do you think of politicians, really? Um, oh, that's a nice one. <laughs> there are some. There are some that I like. There are some that I do not like. Um, I know I've said you might think it's glib. So I think that prevarication at times becomes a prerequisite of a political career. But um, Sir Billy Snedden once, I asked him a question like that, and I said, "Why do you think uh, you must sometimes tell lies?" And he said, "Darren, I have never told a lie in 25 years in politics." And I said, well, with respect, Sir Billy, you've just told you first. <laughs> and he left the table. Do you think they're fair game? Yes, I do. Um, there are times when, um, when it is tough. I mean, in the case of uh, the Premier, Mr Rand, it's been tough for him, very tough for him. And you can understand what he's been through and why I think he would feel bitter about what has happened. But I think in the Royal Commission, when it comes to being a circus, I think you have to remember that uh, out of all this, and even if the Premier is a is a short-term casualty, which he has risen above. Um, you have in New South Wales um, a judge, uh, Mr Justice Street, saying that there was a, a um, sinister attempt by the Chief Dependent Magistrate to pervert the cause of justice. And that is the very mortar on which supposedly the bricks of our society are built. And therefore, even at the expense of Mr Rann, uh, I think that's an important thing that's come out of this Royal Commission. Mm. Would you agree with that, Neville? A very important thing came out of the Royal Commission, and uh, from that point of view, the Royal Commission was worthwhile. I should know. After all, I called the Royal Commission. Yes. Sir. But I can't agree with uh, Darren that uh, politicians are fair game. My view is that there's a constant competition in Australia uh, between the media and politicians. Sometimes the politicians win, sometimes the media loses. But when I, but may I say this? <laughs> hold on, hold on. Wait a second. But whenever, the, whenever someone in the media loses, I can tell you this, they scream louder and more quickly than any politician. Mm. Well, I think that we have on, a, I think on occasion, uh, politicians have used the media, the media has used politicians. And, uh, well, I don't really want to get into that much of a debate. <laughs> but I'll give you an example. I've been accused, and I was editor of the Sydney Sun, of helping through the paper, uh, the Fairfax were a bit different in those days, of helping get Neville Rand elected as Premier of New South Wales. Uh, so Eric Willis came on the, uh, the phone as then leader and saying, you're a pro Rand, you're doing this, you're doing that. And it, your perspective changes when you're in opposition, whether you're Liberal or Labour, you see. Mm -hmm. well, you, you mentioned that editorship there. You were, how old were you when you were the editor? Ah, uh, 30. 30. Mm. And before that, uh, you'd been in the States, hadn't you? Yeah, I had 10 years in, ten ten years years in New York. I didn't expect to ever come back. During the 60s? During the 60s. Was, which is a fairly turbulent time in, uh, in America. It was a terrible time in America because you ended up, uh, sounds grisly, became the funeral correspondent. I mean, there we were at the, uh, at the funeral of Martin Luther King in Atlanta, Georgia, the Ebenezer Baptist Church. You got in there, did you? Uh, yes. Um, a journalist called Ray Kerris and I actually got in there by... Uh, we posed as part of the choir, I think. 
they thought maybe they needed two, two um, white voices in there. And we got in uh, as part of the choir. Uh, but after that, actually, quite seriously, there was a moment of coming out of that funeral when Bobby Kennedy, of course, was uh, ifing and butting about running for president. And coming out of there with Martin Luther King dead, there was a quarter of a million people in the streets of Atlanta. There's a file about t two feet wide to get through. And we were, of course, the journalists who were up the, the top of the church. And as they pushed everybody out of the church, uh, and secret servicemen saying, move, move it, uh, I got jammed in behind Bobby Kennedy for about 20 yards. And it gave an idea, and this, uh, I guess, Neville Rand probably knows more about this than I would, would know more about it, the pressures on politicians. Because here suddenly was the last black hope was dead in America, assassinated. John Kennedy was dead some years before. Now Martin Luther King. We weren't to know that two months later we'd all be in a church for an awful instant replay for Bobby Kennedy. But the pressure on this man, he was much smaller than you think, he had stooped shoulders, and this, you could feel the sound waves coming down. I remember in that time being jammed behind him, thinking, how can any man, any man, handle that pressure? It was amazing. It is extraordinary, isn't it, how pressure does in fact change, physically change, uh, change politicians. Um, I think you were mentioning to me earlier that you were just, in fact, yesterday, I think, interviewed uh, Mr. Mal Fraser. Malcolm Fraser. Yeah. Yes, um, well... the change you've noted in him. Yeah, well, he and I, he's gone one way and Bob Hawke's gone the other. Um, in fact, Malcolm Fraser, we didn't dis dislike each other when he was Prime Minister. It was more close to we detested each other. It was a, <laughs> it was a personal antipathy. I, I called him a Poe face souvenir from the Easter Islands. <laughs> and he, I don't think he ever forgave me for it. But out of office, five months later, he arrives back in Australia. He looks fit. I mean, he's, he laughed on air. I have, I've taped it. I've got a Malcolm <laughs> Fraser laugh, the first one I've heard in probably five years. And he's, he's happy. I mean, if he'd shown some of the qualities that he showed yesterday, he might still be in there, and Bob Hawke might still be out, or Bill Hayden might still be leader of the opposition. But uh, you watch Bob Hawke. I saw him about some weeks ago. And the, the ashen face. Bob Hawke will age amazingly. I mean, Neville ran his Sydney water, which keeps him young, but uh, <laughs> he is, it's um, once again that pressure. Do you see this in... in uh, Not you see the... I, just, I think he looks better than ever. I think he looks fitter now well, than perhaps at any time in the last five years. Well, my brother Joe did say on Sunday when we had a family lunch that after uh, the last few months, my hair is thinner, but my skin is thicker. <laughs> <laughs> When, when you talk about uh, covering events and, uh, and uh, having run-ins with politicians like that and defining how you see um, a journalist, do you often wonder exactly the real reason why you're doing it? I mean, is it power? Is it a vicarious thrill? Is it uh, wanting to be famous? Or what? No, I think as a journalist you start out... Well, I started out as a journalist because I lived next door to the news editor and I used to cut his lawns on the local paper. That's how I became a journalist. I used to cut his lawns and steal his home brew. Uh, at the age of about 14. And I, I was going to be a, a wharfie, I was going to be a parson, I was going to be... I got the papers to join the Navy and thought how regimented it would be. And they sent you forms saying how many pairs of underpants they'd issue you with, and I gave that away. Um, and then there's two forms of journalism. There's the print journalism, which I enjoyed, and I've been doing that now for 24 years as a journalist. Um, radio is different. Now I'm more opinionated. Um, on radio, it's all opinion and I get paid money, I get paid a lot of money, for having opinions on microphones that you hear in every Sydney cab or Melbourne cab. But, but if you put over your opinions like that, then in a way selling yourself self to the, to the public, do you ever get the playback from the public? Do people ever come to you in the street and argue with you about something you said on the show, or what? Oh, yes. Mm. Oh, yes, people um, get very terse about it. Um, they sometimes say, well, you can't honestly believe that. You must, that must be just a, a position. And I said, hell, I have trouble fighting off the arguments of the things I believe in. If you try to do it the other way, you'd go bonkers. Mm. So in terms of things like capital punishment, if I came out on the air and said, hang them, castrate them, do this, do that, I'd probably have more listeners. Yes. I don't believe that. I believe the opposite. Yes. But, I mean, you do like the publicity, don't you? You, you like the, sort of the, the projection of the image. I mean, you're not shy in coming forward in, in, in pushing yourself. Oh, my modesty is exceeded only by my good looks. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, no, but I'm getting at you, see, is, is this something... I have never, you something... said in my introduction, I, I have never called a journalist and said, here's a story. No. I called journalists back because I was a journalist myself. Mm. Uh, we used to get Neville ran out of the shower at 6 o'clock in the morning. Absolutely right. Right? Oh, right. You don't... <laughs> and that's the part of the political life that we don't let on about, I suppose. Calling, now it's 
Now that's John Kane that we bother now for radio at six o'clock in the morning. And now I'm, I'm not, I suppose, shy of being a public person. Um, I'm a softer person, I think. I like, I love animals. I think drug pushes are scum. I'm as feminist as a male possibly can be. Jackie Weaver married me. I can't be all bad. <laughs> <laughs> you took an advert in the paper, of course, to declare your love for Jackie Weaver. I mean, was that a romantic gesture or were you trying to force her arm? I was trying to force her arm. You were, were you? <laughs> um, there was a bit of each. And also, her show was opening in, in Adelaide, and I was very proud of it. And she'd done the show playing a song more than 500 times, and uh, I was very proud of it. I'd seen it 19, 20 times, and, uh, and it worked. And why did you, with, with Linda Stone in that very well publicised affair you had with her, why did you have to sort of confess the breaking up of that on, on, on your radio phoning programme? Because it sounds worse than you put it, um, because when something happens to you and you are hurt and you're living your life on radio three and a half hours a day, that people are still calling you up and, and want to talk about it. And the only way to shut it down, I believe, is to take it head on and say, yes, the rumours are true, it is over. And by doing that and by putting it, taking it on the chin and it hurt like hell, then, then take it and you can move on from it. Um, certainly wasn't a stunt. Yeah. I, mean, I was accused of that. Yeah. Do, do, would you like Neville to have taken up in a full-page advert in the paper declaring his love for you? Would you no, have thought no, that was a, a bit. why? No, no, I would be offended by that. Offended? Yes, I, oh. I believe in being rather more private uh, and keeping one's feelings to oneself. Anyway, There's politicians don't get paid the same uh, same salaries as radio. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I couldn't afford. No, no, right. <laughs> but how, in fact, how did Neville woo you then? I mean, how did he how did he win you over? Uh, well. Um, actually, it's a wonder he did, because I hoped that he was after my mind, and, uh... Well, I, I will confess, <laughs> you did want partly that, too, I think. Oh, yes. yes. Still do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, I, at first I thought that uh, he was interested in me because he hoped I might work for him on his research staff, because when we met, we'd had a long discussion. I'd, uh, it was my first opportunity, I suppose, to uh, indulge years of interest in radical politics and reading the New Statesman and the like, and uh, so he got a full blast on that first night uh, that we met, and uh, then said, well, look, we, uh, interesting conversation, I'd like to continue it, would you like to meet some of my colleagues? <clears throat> and I was so looking forward to meeting Jack Ferguson at that stage, I had to wait, because when I uh, came to meet him uh, as appointed, he was alone. And I sensed his eyes on my legs, and I knew it wasn't so noble and lofty after all. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Darren, they are only human politicians. <laughs> I mean, you've been labouring on this misapprehension they're not for years. Oh, no, it's a tough job, and I know that uh, I, um, I wouldn't like it. I don't think I'd fit into many moulds of political parties, um, so I don't think I'd want to do it. Um, people say that's a cop-out, you sit up there and you attack politicians. But um, journalists and... The, and we should be holding them accountable. Uh, hold the old corny, hold their feet to the fire occasionally. It's your money, it's the taxpayer's money, um, and they should be held accountable. And sometimes there are casualties, and sometimes that sounds cold, but sometimes it must be done. Okay. And I'm a sook, I mean, I, I really am. You're a what? I'm a sook. I, I cry in movies and I do all those things. I'm a I believe anything he tells me, yes. don't you? I really <laughs> do. <laughs> You've never cried over a politician, Darren. <laughs> well, we'll continue this conversation after the break. For the moment, Darren Hinch, thank you very much indeed. Darren Hinch. Thank you, Michael. Right, back in a moment to meet one of the stars of Song and Dance Game at Farl. And see you after this break. <laughs> Darren, we've got... Um, Neville and Jill here, I mean, they're on for a very good reason because they've gone through something, you know, rather particular in the past sort of month or so. But we've tried to get Jackie Weaver, your wife, on uh, the show with you. And I think she, she's probably here tonight, actually, in the green room. No, that. she's out working. Your producer's got her actually uh, well, doing a show for the ABC. But the fact of the matter is that she didn't want to appear on the show with you, did she? No, that's quite true. Why is that? Oh, she thinks that we're, we're independent people. We have our own careers. Uh, we are separate identities. She's scared we'll become the, the new Burton Patty. Um, and I think that's, I think that's <laughs> fair. And I, I support her on that. I think she is, uh, uh, she was proudly walking around calling herself Jacqueline Hinch, but uh, she was called Jackie Weaver. It, it, that's fine by me. We're separate people. How difficult is it, uh, Jill, for a woman to retain a sense of identity when you're, you're married to, as in your case, a premier of, of a state and to a famous man? Well, I, I don't know that I can answer uh, that in terms of giving, you know, giving, giving you a measure of it. Mm. Um, 
Uh, I've not found it particularly difficult. I yeah. think I've managed to show that you can um, manage a career successfully alongside public life. But then At again, least I've tried to do but that. But then again, of course, I mean, recently when you went for that uh, degree, what was it, the business the MBA, management? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you, you took some flack uh, from certain quarters oh, about course. accepting a scholarship, oh, didn't you? Sure. Now, that presumably was directed at you because you were the wife of the, of the Premier of the State. Well, what was your attitude toward that? Oh, I remain unrepentant you do. about that. Uh, after all, you know, I mean, what person would like to be financially dependent upon their husband or their, you know, their spouse? And I, I think we'd all prefer to be independent given the choice. The point is that I wasn't so much given the choice as I worked very hard for it. And uh, after all, it was a scholarship awarded on merit. And I don't think there's any law of life or logic that says that any one of us should be totally dependent upon another person. Mm. And, you know, it was all part of my social conditioning. I come from a family. My grandparents brought me up. My grandfather was one of three brothers who all won scholarships to school, to Newington. And then they all won scholarships to Sydney University. Then they all won scholarships to Oxford. One of them was a Rhodes Scholar. I mean, you know, I've been conditioned to win one's way through life, that rewards only come to you from hard work, no other way. So you're, and, not, you're, uh, not, you're not competing the better and the harder simply because you feel you have, because of your circumstance, being married to Neville, to, to prove yourself more. No, I'm unselfconscious about the public aspect of my life when I'm dealing with the other. Right. Also, uh, Jackie said to me she'd been on the show and it was my turn. <laughs> this is true, yes. yes. <laughs> she was actually on with, with Celeste Patterson. Yes. Yes. Um, it got rather rude that night. That's true, because that show went to New Zealand. My parents <laughs> saw it and they said, this is your future bride. And here was a picture of Les Patterson drooling and, and groveling. And, and worse. And worse. And worse. And worse. Uh, all over my bride to be. That's right. It's not, not a pretty sight. She was, but it's less bad as it wasn't. <laughs> no one was trying to do to her wasn't pretty either. But we had to shoot it all up there, actually. But what about one other point I'd like to make to you, uh, all of you, actually? Um, I mean, when you again go through what you've been through, are you not glad? I asked you uh, uh, before about children. Are you not glad that, that, that you don't have children around to go through that? I mean, do you think there's a, that there is a price that children have to pay in a situation that you're in? Yes, I must say, I think there is, mm. yes. Mm. And I am glad that uh, we're not foisting some of this, um, well, both the approbation and the opprobrium, because they're both open to abuse, right. uh, onto children at the same time. I'm pleased that yes. that's the case. And do you think that politicians, active politicians, such as Neville is, would make good fathers? Yes, I'm convinced of that. You didn't mean that. Yeah. Well, he was <laughs> promised to read the bedtime story at least once or twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, what about re retiring, uh, Neville? I mean, now, has the thought ever occurred to you? Well, oh, if wait it, a minute. <laughs> if, uh, if I ever thought uh, by retiring you mean retiring from politics, mm. if it ever crossed my mind during the Royal Commission, the moment the Royal Commission was over, I couldn't get back to my office uh, quickly enough. And uh, I said somewhat foolishly, I think, when I was asked, uh, what's the first thing you're going to do? I said, I'll kick a few heads in. By that, all I meant by that really was get everyone back on their toes, get the thing going and really, really start uh, right. working hard again. One, right. one of the rules of public life is you never think too far ahead. You no. just make the best of what comes <laughs> along. One tiny step at a time. Besides, I just couldn't cope with all that parliamentary skill in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, have you seen Song and Dance? No, I have not. You have not. Well, go and see it. If you just know you haven't seen it yet, of course, it's open. No, but we're determined to. You're going to. Mm, well, do so. As I said earlier, the, the first half of Song and Dance, the new Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, opening tonight in Sydney, tells the story of an Australian girl in New York and her search for romance. It's a one woman performance calling for extraordinary range and virtuosity. The star is Gay McFarlane, and here she is singing one of the show's loveliest ballads. It's called The Last Man in My Life. <laughs> Was it really? That's a total well, deal. That was harder than most of those exams. <laughs> <laughs> to Darren Hinch. Darren, thanks a lot, mate. Thank you, Mike. Game at Farland, John Meehan, and the rest of the cast of Song and Dance. Go and see it. It's a marvellous show. Next week, a special show from Broken Hill. Until then, from all of us here, good night. Good night.